alive into the world we go. Welcome, everybody. I see some familiar faces and some new faces. Welcome to Art Responders here with Reimagine and an incredible guest we have this evening, Emily Wells. You may know what you're in for. You may not. Other, either way, it's going to be um, a really terrific hour. So yes, we've been featuring some incredible artists who have been responding to what they've been facing in life. You see a couple of them here. And uh, every Wednesday night, we've been with you for this, this journey of discovery and music and comedy and, and dialogue. I am Brad Wolf, founder of Reimagine, as you know. Reimagine is a platform focused on transforming some of the hardest things that we face, death, dying, grief, serious illness, uh, thinking how we might reshape those and change the way that our culture approaches those hard topics, also by not turning away from them, by facing them, and in so doing, um, we believe that we begin to live our lives more fully. So that's, that's really why we are here together. This event is part of the Reimagine Life, Loss, and Love Festival, which lasts until September 1st. So if you want to host an event of your own, you're welcome to do so at letsreimagine.org. We have people hosting events from all over the world, and it's just terrific to see uh, the response of our, our, of our hosts and our attendees and also to these incredible sponsors that have made this all possible. As a nonprofit organization, we really do rely on the support of others to make this possible, uh, these free events as this one is, um, and the contributions from our attendees. So thank you for all of your donations and, and uh, everything you've done to uh, support our, our work in this, in this effort. I also want to make sure that we acknowledge SeaTac. Uh, SeaTac is the organization that's co-presenting this with us. They're the Coalition to Transform Advanced Care, a nonprofit, nonpartisan advocacy organization dedicated uh, to an ideal that really all Americans with advanced illness receive comprehensive, high-quality person and family-centered care consistent with their goals and values, and that honors their dignity. Uh, we have a lot of, in, aligned with CTAC, and we are just grateful that, that they've participated with us in making this all go down. And there she is, my fabulous colleague, Dara. She is teaching us some things about Zoom that most of you are already figuring out. If you're just joining us today, if you want to share where you're calling in from on the chat, that would be fantastic. Uh, if you have questions that come up during this, this hour for Emily, uh, feel free to shoot them in the chat, and we can try to get to some of your questions throughout the conversation. You can also uh, keep your cameras on, ideally, because your faces are what make us feel the best. So thanks for your smiles and for your participation and your gratitude and, and all the love that you've been sharing through this, this portal. Now with that, I want to introduce one of my colleagues, Carrie Lang, who is responsible in large part for how these events have come to pass. And today, as we do before every Reimagine event, we're going to start off with an intention. So if you'd like to close your eyes and listen to Carrie's uh, words, we're going to just set the stage for what's about to come. Thank you, Carrie. There is no life without death, no love without loss. They are in constant complementary motion. In the face of distance, illness, racism, and isolation, we are here together, reimagining a changed world, kinder, slower, more just. We are reimagining the giving and receiving of love, the cycles of loss and new beginnings, and what it means to be fully alive. We are here.
We can't hear you, Brad. Thank you. I somehow, can you hear me now? Thank you so much. Whoever chimed in, I think it was Holly. I don't know how you were able to chime in, but I'm really glad you did because I've been talking to myself. As you see, I, I've, <laughs> I've, I've stepped up my game this week and I have headphones on and a microphone, but what good does that do if you can't hear me? What I was saying, you missed a joke. It was, I even told a joke. It was a great joke uh, while I was gone sharing uh, the wonderful reviews that Emily received from the New York Times. Uh, and I was remarking, the, the review says dramatic metic and meticulous. I was wondering if that was in reference to her music or in reference to just to Emily, but I'm pretty sure it refers to her music. The joke was better the first time. Uh, dramatic, meticulous, and gothic songs, which we're going to hear in, in, in Wells' latest work, This World is Too Blank for You, uh, was released in March and has been hailed as a uh, breathtaking, mind-blowing, and visionary composition. Um, let's see. And so with that, I want to welcome Emily. We're going to hear some music from her today. And we're going to have a conversation. We're going to invite all of you to participate by asking questions and hear how Emily has been able to use her own form of expression uh, to respond to the world around her and channel that energy into metabolizing it into something, you know, we'll, we'll find out exactly what that something is. Beautiful, I would say, uh, breathtaking, just transforming that energy into something else that allows her to move forward in, in, in her own life. So Emily, welcome. Hey, thank you so much. It's a pleasure. Um, let's see if I can see you on my screen. Where did you go? There you are. All right, so there you are, and there's even people behind you. Who do you have behind you right now? That's uh, uh, Nureyev um, doing an incredible feat of dance over and over again, edited to show the remarkableness of his over and over again. So Emily, I've, I've always wanted to start an interview like this, and I'm going to try it right now. Okay. Who are you, and why are you here? Um, no pressure. <laughs> I'm just a, a humble servant, right, I guess? And um, I'm here to, to love and to be loved and to play music and um, to learn, I guess. Thank you for being here. How, how, how is it, you know, we, this, this reimagine, as you know, focuses on these certain themes. How do you high relate, you know, what, 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 I mean, why are you here with art responders around these, these certain themes? Well, so I started working on, I, I'm currently working on a record that's also going to involve some essays um, because I got really interested in the idea of looking at the AIDS crisis, looking at ACT UP, looking at how people were responding to the AIDS crisis at the height of it, and how can we learn from them when we're looking at climate crisis. So this has been, and it kind of started with um, the death of a person named David Buckle, who maybe you remember, it was kind of like a blip in like the news cycle, but he was an activist, a lawyer, um, who fought a lot for for gay rights, trans rights. And he became like obsessed with environmental justice and he eventually self-immolated as a, as a form of protest in Prospect Park like a year and a half ago. And so that idea sort of came from thinking about his death, thinking about the lack of attention his death got um, and, and wanting to, to look into that, to go deeper into that. And so then, you know, now it's becoming even more and more about, there's so many artists that I loved that passed from AIDS. And um, so it's also kind of like an homage to their work. And um, how can I learn from that as an artist? You know, as an activist, yes, but also as an artist. So why don't we get going with some music? That, I mean, I'd love to just enter the fray with, with I mean, <laughs> this is the best setup I've seen anyone with art responders uh, participate with so far. You have, it looks like a violin, some keyboards, visuals. You, this is the whole nine yards. So we're really excited to, to hear what it is you do. Maybe you could set up the first piece for us. Sure, sure. So this song's called The Dress Rehearsal. And I wrote it, I started visiting these woods as soon as I 
was sheltering in place every day. And um, my partner was super sick. We we're like, does she have it? What's going on? Um, and I, we would, I would, I would go out um, with my dog to these woods. Um, and there was this, the beginning of this renewal because it was like early spring. And there were, th there was this pair of foxes that I would always observe. And I had this conversation with a friend of mine about um, Hannah Aaron's idea that that human beings are the only mortal beings because animals and plants and everything know how to like renew in this really holistic kind of way. But we've sort of made ourselves mortal with our intellect and um, our ideas around what it means to be a person. Um, so, so that's one place that the song came from. And then like halfway through writing the song, I was on a walk there one day and um, I saw these people leading these police officers to a body. So someone had been shot in the middle of the woods. And I was, they, you know, ushered me away, but I saw his body there. And um, so it completely transformed these woods and this song. And it obviously became a place of like grief. And I was trying to figure out how to turn that grief around. And I would like visit the, the place where his body had been and like leave things, you know? Um, anyway. Um, it was quite a, so anyway, then I um, turned to an AIDS activist named um, Nyland Blake, who made this piece as part of this whole collective about where did the love go? And um, he had these stickers that said love happened here and then you could like write in and place them all over the city, right? So it was a way to like commemorate love. It doesn't have to be physical love. It could be any kind of love happening in these these places, and to remind people to make love public. Um, so I kind of put all of these ideas together um, in this song. Amazing. Uh, that is a uh, horrible yet <laughs> right. powerful, interesting story. And l let's hear what, how that goes. Okay.
That was cool. that was absolutely gorgeous, seriously. And it's it was so cool to hear you talk about the song first, uh, to, to then hear those and and feel and think through those the images that that you you evoked through the, the words and the music. How, as an artist, I'm curious. How do you feel about sharing the meaning behind your songs? Oh, it, you know, it, I like it if 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 I can really go there. Um, but sometimes I feel like there's just so many ideas, right? And, and how can I discuss them? And like a song is that, it is the only portal that allows for you not to have to discuss them. So it feels like this kind of a funny thing to um, <clears throat> take this incredible form of expression and then try to like run it through some kind of, you know, film or something. But I also love the opportunity um, to to try try to meet that challenge, you know. Yeah, because some some artists want, you know, I've I've experienced this. They 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 want you to be able to put whatever the art is the expression in and of itself. Sure. And they don't want to cloud it with any. I mean, of course, I asked you a question, so you could have dodged the question. I'm I'm grateful that you you answered the question. Yeah, no, I mean, I vacillate between really identifying with, like, the minimalists, like, John Cage and, and, mm -hmm. and like, a lot of the dancers that I really love that are, like, really about removing form and, and removing all these kind of barriers that classicalism can, can impose upon the artist. Um, and then also being, like, really interested in meaning and words and, um, and also, yeah, like, conceptual. So, um but I, I love, I, I get to, like, I'm, I'm the boss of this world, so I can do that. I can vacillate as much as I like, you know? Exactly. That's why you're the featured, featured artist. No, no, uh, I mean. No, I, I get it. No, no. I get it. I get it. <laughs> uh, so, so, so speaking about self-expression, right, and, and this art form, how did you discover music? I mean, my, well, my father was a music minister, um, so I was just, it was just part of my household, you know, um, and I, I started playing violin as a really young kid. I saw um, this person named Midori, uh, like a young prodigy playing on Johnny Carson, and I was like, that's, that's, I want to do that, and um, pestered my mother until she, she enrolled me in the local Suzuki violin program, so, um, but yeah, I mean, choir, choirs and orchestras, I mean, it was always a big part of my world. My father played the French horn and... And so, I know, maybe you can speak a little bit about growing up in, in your household and how that's influenced your art and your, and your point of view. Yeah, I mean, my, um, like I said, my father was a music minister, but then he came out later in life, like around the same time as when I was coming out. So um, we have this like odd trajectory of kind of becoming adolescents at the same time again together. <laughs> and, um, and it's just, it's just been this lifelong journey of, um, for my whole family, like what does that mean and how can we all still love each other? And um, my father in, is a big part of my work. I mean, I'm working on this opera that is down the line, but where I want to kind of reinvent his life as though he had come out as a young man and uh, get to relive that with him through songs and, um, and through history. And, and do you think, I mean, I'm sure, have you, you have envisioned his, do you have a vision for his whole life already? It's not so linear. I mean, the, I think... I'm falling, I'm like gonna go more into the, the minimalist's world a little bit, I think, a little more surrealism, um, or like, you know, Ghosts of Christmas Past or something, <laughs> you know, where you sort of enter uh, these vignettes. Um, and I wanna use, you know, projection and everything to help me do that. Um. And, and, and so, so what was it, I mean, what was it like to be coming out at the same time and and was were you already writing these these types of songs at that in that period or was or did that inspire this type of work that you're exploring now or t 
Yeah, I say mean, more. That was like a lifetime ago, so I wish I was writing like sophisticated music at that time. But I was writing songs for sure. Um, yeah, and my father and I have tried to do. You know, I like this last project, for instance. I wanted a French horn to be part of the arrangements so that we could perform it together, and then we have. You know, um, I don't know if that. Yeah, so it's, it's it's amazing that that you've had a chance to perform with him and then experience. Most people maybe have one type of relationship with their parents, so it seems really neat that you've had the opportunity to explore these different types of relationships. It um, is, yeah. It's such a gift. I mean, that's what that's the power of music, right? It's like the one place everybody can can be together without argument. <laughs> and, and do you feel? to that point, I mean, what do you think about playing with music with other people versus playing alone? Uh, I need both, you know, I really need both. And I really feeling the, lo the, the loss of not playing with other people for the last few months. But I am also very much like, you know, a, a writer in the sense of like, I need my, 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 to create a small world and then unfurl slowly, you know? Um, and I've done plenty of shows alone. Um, and that's actually why I started having these projections is because I wanted to sort of trick myself and everybody else into believing that there were people on stage with me. Um, and then uh, that just kind of grew from there. But, um, but, you know, I'm in a phase of my work where I want to have b a bigger vision to play with more people. The last record, you know, had a chamber or orchestra and, you know, was like a lot more um, realized, you know, in that way. And playing alone sometimes is just a, a you know, a happens because of lack of resource or, you know, whatever. But, um, yeah. And, and so, who, who, you know, you, if you get the chance, you, you know, given you're using this medium that you've created with the with the visuals you can perform literally with anyone if that's how you're here interpreting it so who do you how did you select who, who do you who's behind you well <clears throat> pardon me it started with um a mild obsession with pina bausch <clears throat> and she has this absurdist film called the Clage de Coserin, the complaint of an empress which is just absolutely brilliant and it's not exactly dance but a lot of the people that are performing these repetitive sort of agonistic things are um, dancers, so that it has a feeling of dance. Um, and and uh, fr from there, just like, I just grew my love of contemporary dance. And then I also started including other films, like uh, The Color of Pomegranate is playing right now. And um, I have a Glenn Gould, I love Glenn Gould, so I was like, why not? He should join the party. and. Um, is that another dancer? I'm sorry, uh, I, I'm my uh, naivete. Not at all. He's a pianist, and he was um, eccentric, let's say, and he, the way he performed was sort of dancerly. He had like this this way of hitting the keys, and he would kind of mumble along. And he he like really reinterpreted Bach in a way that some people think is like the ultimate. Some people don't, but I love it. Cool. I'm gonna check that out. So so. so has, have those musicians also influenced your your music? Sure, yeah. I mean, everything's an influence, you know? It's like, and that's why you have to be careful about what you take in, you know? It's like, it, it all seeps in. So I've taken, like, I've been, like, off social media and, and trying to be off less news, you know, for the last three weeks. I feel like my brain is literally rewiring because of it, you know? It's like, I'm just reading all the time and... Honestly, I think that's the biggest challenge of our of our time, what you're saying. It's it's no longer when the data is getting created so quickly and, and it's not a matter of, it's a matter of what you don't put in. It's like, how do we filter out? Right. Mm -hmm. Because we're so affected in, in by what we see and if we're staring at our politics or I mean, in some cases, it's, it motivates us to action, obviously, when you see certain right. imagery. But being very discerning around what we put in our brains, there's been a whole movement around our, what we consume in our bellies. But mm. what about what we put into our, our minds? Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. No, I know. I, and, and you have to think about that as an artist, 
I, I really think about that a lot when I'm, especially in this phase of, of writing, it's like every choice that I make, every conversation I have, every, every thing I read or look at or watch is part of that process, you know? And, um, and which is wonderful. Like, that's like an incredible thing, like that you can absorb so much and you can, you can turn to all these things and when you get stuck, you have a bookshelf to go to, you know? Um, or a film to see, or you used to could go to a concert, you know, like that. Or you could come to an event like this, you know, like there's, there is um, real power in that. Um, so, but you do have to be mindful. I'm susceptible, you know, just as anyone. Yeah, no, some people are more susceptible, I feel like, than others to, and I think as an artist specifically, that, that sensitivity t toward what you observe and how that yeah. then translates into your work has real bearing. Um, so, so, so I would love to set up the next song that you're going to play. Yeah. Why don't you tell us a little bit about what your, your next piece? Yeah, I mean, this kind of speaks to what we're just talking about. I'm, it's, called, it's called I'm Numbers. And I wrote, this was the first song I wrote after, um, you know, the pandemic moved to the United States. And that kind of obsession with the numbers. Um, and it also really related to all the research that I've been doing about the AIDS pandemic, and um, so for instance, I was thinking a lot about Felix Gonzalez Torres. <clears throat> He's an artist too. One of his more famous pieces that relates to this is um, he had 175 pounds worth of candy in, the, in a gallery, which was the weight of his lover when he was like at his healthiest weight. And so the people who come to the gallery are invited to remove a piece of candy, and so he, his body weight shrinks and shrinks just as it did as he was dying of AIDS. So, I, and his, his work's all about like, these kinds of like, this kinds of precision thinking, you know? And, um, <clears throat> and then I was also um, thinking about uh, this Jenny Holzer piece and researching a little bit about, I came across it in my research called Laments. And um, she asked people who were, who were very ill uh, with AIDS to s say something about their experience and um, one, of the, one of the things was, I need to lie uh, back to front with someone who adores me. And at that moment in particular, like there was this, it was when everyone, you know, couldn't, couldn't touch. Um, uh, and that line really struck me and I, I put it in the song. Um, so yeah, I'll play it for you. Thank you.
give you all for me forever I take some, I take some And if you offer me tonight I take some, I take some And if you offer me tomorrow What a delight Take some And if you offer me forever I take some Ooh. Ooh. Ah. Ooh. Ooh. I'm numbers, I'm numbers, I'm numbers till I'm not Whoa. <laughs> Blew the metaphorical roof off this Zoom call. <laughs> uh, wow. That, you know, I, I feel badly for asking the question earlier about playing with other musicians. It feels like, what, <laughs> you know, what was that about? You, you got, you got this, you got your own orchestra uh, with the different faces of, <laughs> of your own, your own mirror. Yeah. Um, yeah, what a gift as someone just said in the chat, a lot of hearts. If, if, by the way, if anyone out there has a question for Emily, let me know and I can try to get to that. Thank you so much for that, that piece. And what a, you know, in the context of, of COVID, yeah. um, you know, it's very powerful. I'm, I'm curious about you, this time for you and, and how you've been metabolizing this and, and how that relates to this project that you're describing. I, you know, it's really kicked the door open to this project, but in, in a way that makes me feel like a lot of light is shining in my face so I can't see anything. You know, it's like, it's so recontextualizing or elevating this project in a certain way because of everything that is exposing all the disparities, the racial disparities, the, you know, how, how much money people have, where people live on the planet, like all of these things that like, Climate crisis, AIDS crisis are completely also like hand and glove with, you know? So um, I think it just makes it a little bit more um, like you can see it a little less, I guess I should say a little less abstract. I feel like, um, especially in the US where um, although it's changing from year to year, you know, our view of climate change is, 
is, you know, we're able to view it from afar a little bit, or we have been, and um, this is like right here in all of our faces. Uh, you know, that's kind of what the, the first song, the dress rehearsal, is like, I feel like we're all kind of experiencing like a dress rehearsal for the future. I mean, I know that's grim, but, um, but I, it's kind of like what this whole project is about. It's like turn to it instead of away from it so that we can like figure out how to have mutual aid, how to ha like be like holding the hands of those we love and those we don't know but want to love, you know. So, ha so, okay, let's back up for one sec. <laughs> so there's, there's, the, there's AIDS and there's right. a climate crisis. Right. So at first, maybe let's just help me establish the relationship that you're seeing, you know, how did those two things come t t together for you? I just, I feel like the, um, what we're up against as far as like, from like a bureaucratic and like science denial standpoint, there's like some parallels. Um, and also like from a long term standpoint, like fighting to like find the cure for AIDS or even just, just to like triage people from dying was like, many years, like, and I, I just read something about how, like, what we're doing now, like, to combat climate crisis, we might not see the effects of that for, like, 30 years, right? And meanwhile, like, there was just a person who um, is, like, <clears throat> potentially cured of AIDS, right, 30 years later. So, uh, from, like, the peak of the crisis, so, or some would say the beginning of the crisis. So, I guess those are some of the parallels that I'm drawing from a practical standpoint, but from a sort of emotional, intellectual standpoint, I'm looking at, okay, what did they do? Like, how did they get creative? How did they, like, not make this, like, Al Gore show? You know what I mean? Like, how, how do we channel that? Like, how do we throw ourselves in, um, all in, and, 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 like, our lives depend on it, right? So that, that's a connection for me. And so is, is COVID in this, this pandemic, I mean, is that just a third, is it a third bucket, or is it, is it, you know, where do you see that relative to those other two pieces? I just see it as like, yeah, all, all of a whole, you know, it's just like a further exposure of, like I was saying before, of just um, kind of what we're up against. Yeah, so it's, do you see, do you find hope in, in this or despair? I mean, I'm sure there's, I know there's despair, but wh wh where, do you, where are you finding hope? Um, yeah, I'm definitely finding hope. I mean, the as devastating as the AIDS crisis was, I mean, there was so much creativity and love that went into that movement and that goes into that movement to this day, you know. Um, and the science that is, I mean, think about how far we've come in 30 years, mm -hmm. right? Um, and I, so yeah, I definitely find hope there. And I mean, I, I can, I don't, I don't know that I, I'm just a curious person, which sometimes looks like pessimism to some people. <laughs> I just like information, you know, so. Yeah, so someone asked, I mean, to your point, how does your brain work? <laughs> how does my brain work? Yeah, like tell us exactly how your brain works. Oh, God, I wish I knew. I mean, I, I just, I don't know. I put things in and I, I metabolize, I guess, like you're saying. Um, and I... I sometimes am like completely rabid and other times I'm like totally spent, you know, um, and I, and I try to like let music lift up the, the times when I don't know how to be rabid, you know. And so you're saying you're right, you're doing writing about these, these issues as well, right? There's, is that, that's correct? Yes, uh-huh. And so how do you decide when to write with words? I mean, there's words how, on a page versus when to turn it into music? Well, I I'll admit I've been doing a lot more music in the last four months than sitting down and writing, partially because I it's like saving me, you know? Um, and like I was saying, like it feels like I'm walking into like really bright light. Like I know that there's a lot here and I can't quite see it yet. Like my eyes are like way too dilated right now um, to fully to go in. But um, meanwhile, I'm like researching, like I'm kind of in like a take in information part of the writing process. Um, and, um, and I'm, you know, I'm writing, but not anything I'd, I'd, I'd attempt to publish. 
Well, you're, de I mean, you're definitely publishing music. I mean, someone, some, I know these songs are new. Someone asked in, in the chat, and I, I think, you know, if, if I was, if I was looking for, for work, uh, and it says, are you signed to a music label? And you were not signed to a music label. That would be a great, um, you know, I'd be like, yeah, I'll sign you right now. Well, I, I actually, I've been on labels before. I have my own label now with distribution. So I'm like kind of digging owning all my own stuff, you know? Fine. Sorry to say. Okay. Well, <laughs> it's understandable. So I'm, I'm curious also, you, 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 I see this quote that, that we have from you. Um, you said you're keenly aware of your own mortality and your own desire to survive. Yeah. And you have this attachment to numbers. Just t t tell us about survival and mortality and, and how you think about those subjects. I mean, I guess I keep, you know, like all of us, I keep like knocking my head against that. Um, and I, in that what you're referring to was like something that I felt like, you know how like you've had a cold for a long time and then suddenly you're, you're better and you can smell. I felt like when the COVID hit, like I could smell again in a certain way. There was this kind of like, um, almost like a physical response, um, especially for the first month where I was just, everything was so heightened. And I also was like, I, I really want to live. Like I really want to survive. Um, and you know, I have asthma. And so like at the beginning, especially there's like, what's going to happen with people with asthma, like, you know, all of that kind of thing. There's just like all this unknown. And so, yeah, I mean, I, but long before COVID, I've certainly been, you know, banging my head against, uh, ideas around mortality. And, um, I work through it in my work a lot. And I grew up in a house that believed in heaven and hell. And I've had to like figure out how to navigate that. Um, and fight that, um, or embrace it in certain ways, you know, um, cause I, you know, when you grow up in that kind of household, mortality is, um, sort of sketched out for you right into your small sponge brain, you know? So is it, is it, has your vision of mortality shifted wildly over the course of your life or, or yeah, where, how has that evolved? Yeah. I mean, I guess I just believe in it more than I used to, <laughs> if that makes sense. The idea that it, it's real. Yes. It and is. and it makes us more present in it? Or? Yeah, I mean, maybe. I, I don't think it necessarily does. I think that's up to us, you know, to be present mm -hmm. in it or not. Um, and trust me, there's plenty of days I choose to forget it, and that's fine, I think. You know, I don't, it's not like I think, it's healthy to just like think about death all the time. I'm not like Billy Crystal and when Harry met Sally. <laughs> <laughs> so with that in mind, what, what is the third song you're going to play us? Well, actually, the, this it's interesting that we're talking about this because the, the final verse of this song is kind of that, an, an acknowledgement of that, um, um, that the, the hugeness of time and of, of the earth and the smallness of, of the self. Um, but the song is about a day in my house with me and my partner, who's also an artist. She's a video maker, a painter, brilliant. And um, we had just collaborated on a video together. Um, we'd been working on that for a while. And I was, I, I'd been reading this book by Bill T. Jones, this choreographer who's like brilliant. Everybody should check him out. Really, really interesting. Um, and he has this book called Last Night on Earth that he wrote in 95. And he was um, partnered with a man named Arnie Zane, and they collaborated together for the whole time they were together. Arnie eventually uh, passed away of AIDS, uh, hence the research element of the, the book, right? Um, but this book was just so musical and wonderful and, and really made you believe again, made me think so much about the power of of art and like that that's the lens you know that's the lens to always turn to and collaboration to um as well so this song's called um arnie and bill to the rescue and they kind of uh represent um remembering to turn to that but the song starts with <clears throat> this morning when my 
not this morning, but the morning of that the song is about, my partner comes into the room and um, she's just learned about Elijah McLean's death. And, I, and she was, you know, completely just devastated um, as I could fall to pieces right now just talking about it, right? And so I remember her saying that morning, I'd riot, you know, like that was evoking this kind of um, anger um, in her uh, otherwise very peaceful and law-abiding soul. So um, <laughs> um, anyway, that's the day that we, um, we had. It started with that. And then I told her about the death of Arnie. And then we had this, it was kind of like you're saying, like this moment of just like accepting our mortality, accepting like the absolute grace of that moment together, you know? So that's what the song's about. And actually, no one's heard it. She hasn't even heard it. So uh, this is we'll a send her a copy when we're done. Yeah, we'll send her a copy. Hmm. Um, yeah, all right. Sure. Shall I play it then? Yeah, let's introduce this to the to the world. No pressure. Good luck.
Wow. Thank you so much. That is, that is beautiful. Thank you. Do, do you know Samantha Nye? I do. She's been listening. Oh, yeah? So now she has heard the song. I figured as much. <laughs> All right. So no need to send the copies anywhere. Uh, but we will anyway. So I have, I have one more question for you because this has honestly been so, so gorgeous. Your music and your, and your thoughtfulness, your words um, in, in so many contexts. And also if you're out there um, in the audience, if you want to just share your gratitude for Emily and, and, and her voice, uh, when I say your, your voice, I don't just mean your beautiful singing voice, but just the voice that's shining through all these domains. Um, um, curious if, if I'm out there watching you right now and blown away by, you know, all the things that are going into your music, uh, and I'm trying to deal with mortality and, and the grief that's all around us right now and the fear, but I can't do what you can do. I can't, I don't have the, the, these, I, f I feel like I don't have the talent. It, you know, I, I don't, I can't make this beautiful music. What would you tell somebody who, who, who said that to you? I think we all have like creators in us and also like we are part of this bigger creation. <clears throat> that makes sense? Not to be a creationist, I just mean, you know, the world. And um, it's there, you know, it's there for you in the sense of it's in the air we breathe, it's in, um, yeah, walk, walk around, like go out there in it and, and be part of it. And also, I think as if you're a reader, like you become part of that, like in a way, like, you know, art is completed by the audience. Um, I'm sure we've all thought about that, talked about that before, but, um, but I really think there's truth to that, especially in moments like this, like, like there's so many answers so many people that have lived through so much that have documented their grief and their fear and also their hope and their like ideas you know um <clears throat> and like if you let your mind get turned by those things like that's just the beginning right then your mind can keep turning um so that's that's what i would say yeah like try to try to go try to go to people that have already done it you know? Yeah, honestly, that's so beautiful because even when you think about something like death, it's, it's, it's what helps me think about it is there's been, you know, what there's seven point something billion people on the planet right now, but there's been 120 billion people or more, you know, that have died. Yeah. Yeah. They've, they've had the, the people have had these experiences. We're not alone in these experiences and it's so easy to forget that. And so I thought what you shared just now, I'm going to just uh, take a little snippet of that and make that a video and then watch that uh, when I'm when I'm feeling alone and confused. Good. Thank you, Emily. Thank you, uh, so I want to now close out the session um, by sharing a little bit more about Emily. Here is how to follow her because honestly, everyone, everyone should. Uh, your music, your your voice, you know, your spirit. Here's your website, emilywellsmusic.com. Follow you on Facebook, on Spotify. I've been hanging out on your Spotify playlist uh, since I had a chance to meet you, and I'm going to continue doing it. So, so yeah, follow Emily's music. Um, she's she's. Are you are you playing other things right now that people can see you? perform or is this i mean i know this we're lucky here but tell us how lucky we are i guess you're, you're very <laughs> in fact uh no i'm not doing much i i'm um like i said i'm in this writing research zone and i'm just kind of treating this time like i'm on a magical residency with my partner who's also on a magical residency um and with a very cute dog you know so um it's not to say that i won't i certainly will but i've um yeah, it's like, obviously I'm thinking about, I'm writing about and trying to digest a lot of big ideas. Um, and I'm, so in a way I'm like just allowing 
a space for that. I don't know why I'm justifying it. No, I'm not really doing a lot of the live streams. No, I, I just, no, we are basically, we are very lucky. Thank you so much for gracing us with your, your presence and your music. And we'll, we will publish some cool stuff and, and maybe share these songs that you just played um, again so people can find them because that was ter d delightful. Um, our next uh, our next guest next Wednesday is Freya um, Roizen. And she, who I, I, I spoke to her a couple of weeks ago, and she's also going to really blow your mind with her poetry uh, and, and her words and her own journey. So I, I invite and implore everyone to come next week, bring a friend, because these are really special sessions to, to, to get inside uh, the brains of, of uh, these incredible uh, artists. Of course, you can also check out our virtual memorial guide if, if you know someone who's, who's recently died or is, is nearing the end of their life and need to plan a virtual memorial. In fact, I have to do that myself for my girlfriend's grandmother who just died yesterday alone uh, without her family being able to see her. And so, you know, I'm going to the site myself to, to put together uh, a memorial for her. And so the final question we leave everyone with each week is how might you respond? And I think Emily provided a template for us. I'm going to leave us with one of Emily's recorded songs, which I think the message of the song, or certainly the title, is, is my uh, two words of, of hope for everybody. Stay up. So let's all stay up together. Thank you again for coming. Here's Emily's uh, Stay Up. And thank you again for being a part of Reimagine's Art Responders. Oh, get the flood Draws up Rain in the yard Listening for Forever Dry the carpets out Into the sun Don't you get lonely Don't you get angry
All right, thank you, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks to Emily. We'll see you again next week.